Hi everyone, welcome to another Artist Loft 101 drawing class. This is a, a repeat of a class that we had two weeks ago on uh, draw developing value drawing skills through drawing trees. Uh, it is an advanced class, so if you found yourself here today and you don't consider yourself an advanced artist, um, stick around because we will definitely, you'll learn something even if you feel like uh, some of the, the skills in the class are a bit beyond you and I um, encourage you to try even if uh, you're feeling that way you don't necessarily have to share what you draw um, and every effort that we make is you know part of the process in in practice and getting better um, so I am Adrian Hodge the instructor uh, for the class and for all of these artist loft 101 drawing classes and I'm honored to be partnered with Michaels to bring you this series. And I am based in Austin, Texas. I'm a teaching artist. I've been teaching all ages for over a decade, primarily adults. Um, I make and show my own work and exhibit work. I've actually um, got some work coming up in a, a group exhibition and I'll be part of the Austin studio tour this fall. So if you're in Austin, you can uh, check out those things. You can see what I'm up to um, all the time by following me on Instagram and Jimena will drop that in the chat. And I've also got it, uh, the tag here on my, my desk in just a moment. Um, but I see we've got folks joining us from all over the place. Welcome and happy to have you here. I'm gonna let um, our lovely moderator, Jimena, uh, handle most of the questions that are, are coming in through the chat because um, I've just learned it's it's hard to keep up with that and we, we have her there. So um, really appreciate her help when I ask questions. I'll just wait for her to uh, filter the answers through and um, likewise with the, the comments if there are you know, some really pressing questions or um, concerns that are coming up, then we'll address those. And if you miss anything or if the class uh, goes a little fast for you, you can always watch the uh, recording later on YouTube or on the Michaels website. We'll link to the, the YouTube classes later. And I think that's all I wanted to say. So um, we'll go ahead and switch to my desktop view. So there is my uh, my handle on Instagram. If you want to follow me on Instagram, I'm at Adrian Hodge Art, and um, there are more places you can find me online on Facebook. Uh, there's my email, my website. I also have a link tree which you can find uh, in my bio on my Instagram. And any work that you make from the class, please tag it with "Make It With Michaels" or "Michaels Classes." Uh, and if you want to make sure that I see it, you can uh, tag me even, you know, just in the, your comment under your picture if you don't want to tag me in the, the photo itself. Um, I, I loved seeing all the work that people have been creating from these classes so far. Um, but if they don't tag me when they post it, then it sometimes gets buried in those uh, hashtags. So uh, if you want to make sure I see it, you can tag me or you can even email it to me. A lot of people have done that as well. And here's some of my original art on my, my business cards here. I do a lot of work in calligraphy ink and a lot of water-based mixed media, some collage, things like that. And everything that I do is very drawing based. So um, even though I'm working with paint brushes, a lot of times I'm using a lot of drawing skills because pen and ink has always been um, one of my, my go-to mediums. And we'll be getting into a lot of pen and ink stuff here in this drawing series in the, the next few weeks. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so, but tonight uh, we're still, so far in the series, we've been really graphite heavy um, with a little charcoal sprinkled in. So tonight is another graphite heavy class. We're using, uh, I'm using the Artist Loft sketching pencils. I've got the 12 set there. I've also got some of uh, the same pencils, the Artist Loft brand, but from the, the 101 kit here. You're going to want your um, a, a variety of H and B pencils. So if you don't have all 12 of those in that set, you, you definitely want to have a couple of uh, lighter pencils, uh, like a 2H, a 4H, 
5H sort of thing, um, and you're definitely going to want some heavier pencils like a 4B, uh, 6B, 2B, etc. Um, for those darker values, and then uh, synthetic eraser, and then uh, the blending stumps or tortillions, and then uh, a photograph of a tree was recommended on the supply list last time. Several folks did use uh, the image that I was using. Um, I was asked to put it up on the screen a couple times so that people could take a photograph of uh, the photo that I'm using. So if anybody is interested in doing that, that would be fine. Um, so I'm working from the, the same image that I did in the, the last version of this class, which if you saw that one, this will be a little bit different. Um, every time I teach the same subject, there's always, you know, something different occurs just since I'm not a robot. So if you saw the first class and are thinking it's going to be a total repeat, um, it will not be, I assure you. Um, but I suggest that you find a photograph of your own to use, um, just because I always think it's more rewarding when we make a work of art from a photo that we took. And I guarantee you have a photo of a tree on your phone. If you pull up your phone's camera settings, go to your, uh, or your photo settings, and uh, just go to the search bar and put in tree, it will pull up every picture on your phone or a lot of pictures on your phone that the AI recognizes as having a tree in it or in the background. And you know maybe there is a tree in your life that is meaningful to you that you could draw. And I always find that more rewarding. So this is a tree in my neighborhood that um, this uh, a live oak tree that is just really special to me. So that's the, the photo that I'm using. And then the drawing that was referenced um, <clears throat> in the advertisement for the class is another tree in my neighborhood that used to be very dear to me, but it was eventually cut down. But I loved that it was, even though the tree was mostly broken, there was still, it was still connected. And it, um, you know, the, the leaves would fall off in the winter, but they would come back in the spring, it was still alive. And so I just love to think of it as a metaphor for you know that line bend but don't break that that tree was sort of broken but it was still alive and and thriving but then somebody cut it down and i was very sad and i'm and i even cried um anyway but i have a lovely painting that i made in calligraphy ink of this same tree and this is the, the drawing anyway enough show and tell about all my favorite trees um so what we're going to be focusing on tonight is um developing value right with uh, trees as our subject matter. And there are a lot of pitfalls that I see uh, my adult students or students of, of all ages even um, struggling with when it comes to trees as subject matter. So I'm gonna touch on a lot of do's and don'ts when it comes to drawing trees. The main um, do that I'm going to promote to you is to not necessarily um finish your tree drawing so this drawing of a tree i think is pretty impressive uh sketch here it's not necessarily what you would call fully developed i like the word fully developed as opposed to finished because finished is such a subjective term in art right but um I only really developed in this drawing a couple of areas of this tree and I left a lot of other areas of the drawing very underdeveloped right not necessarily finished or unfinished but underdeveloped and if I cover up the parts of the tree that I did develop, you can really see how I didn't develop the the other parts right so the parts where I focused my attention the most were. Here where the, the tree is split, um, sort of this, this top half right here and this area right here at the, the part where it was split. And then down here at the bottom towards the, the ground, I focused a lot of attention right here, but I also left the bottom of the tree very undeveloped as well. So since we just have an hour here, you know, manage your expectations of what you may get um, 
get completed in in this hour and a lot of people from the last class who sent me their drawings like uh, in an email or held up their drawings at the end of the class had wonderful examples of these um, you know more of like a tree study or a sketch so I like to always in the learning phase of any class refer to the work that we do as a study or a sketch so that you don't put pressure on yourself to necessarily finish everything so we're going to be focusing on building uh, value and contours with with trees as our subjects and we maybe will not completely finish these drawings so that being said the last time uh the last class this was as far as i got with my demo and uh, tonight I'm planning to continue working on this one, but I'll tell you how I got there. And uh, before I get started working on that some more, I'm gonna do some preliminary sketching to help us get started with our various tree subject matters that we may have. Okay, so in the preliminary phase of, of any drawing, I like to say, you know, you front end all of your hard work when it comes to drawing and painting. Um, you know, if you do enough planning and sketching and observing and theorizing, then things just basically draw and paint themselves. You hardly have to do any real work, people. Um, so I'm just going to use a 4B here just so that my drawings are coming through nice and um, heavy, I mean, some of my lines are coming through nice and heavy, but you use whatever pencil feels right for you. Um, I've noticed there have been a lot of questions throughout the classes so far of what pencil am I using? Um, it's, you know, I'm in these classes always going to use a heavier pencil for a couple of reasons. Um, and by heavier, I mean softer, like a 4B or a 6B, a darker, heavier pencil. And that is because I am a professional and I am an advanced artist. And so I have a lot of confidence in what I'm doing when I begin to draw. And that's not to sound, you know, conceited or anything. It's just, you know, it's just a fact. Um, but it, because I because I am so confident in what I'm doing, I don't have to worry about erasing uh, too much. But if you're not at that point where you feel super confident in every mark that you make, then I don't recommend using a 4B or a 6B with your preliminary sketching. I recommend using an H, uh, 2H, uh, 4H, you know, something that's easy to erase and holding your pencil towards the back of the pencil so that you can easily erase your lines. Um, hey, and then, yes. We have a, a question speaking of um, erasing. So uh, is there an eraser you prefer? Like what about needed erasers versus the regular kind? What would you um, recommend? I honestly prefer just a synthetic eraser unless I'm working with um, blending with charcoal or using a, a tonal ground, which there was a previous class on tonal shading with and without a ground where I talked about going back and forth between a kneaded eraser and graphite. Um, but just for um, a sketch on white paper with, you know, without the use of a ground and just using my graphite sketching pencils, I'm, I'm fine with a synthetic eraser. Like, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, any other questions that are jumping out? Not so far. Okay, so, um, so yeah, I'm using a 4B to do the preliminary sketching so that my lines will show up on the, the camera nice and dark. And because I honestly don't usually need the eraser as much as as the average person. I even, there's a class I've been teaching here in Austin for over eight years that's called, or maybe seven years, um, called Ditch Your Eraser. It's a pen and ink drawing class. And the whole point of the class is to, you know, I always joke, it's not, it shouldn't be called ditch your eraser. It should be called rely on your eraser a little less because a lot of the things I teach in that class are centered around or just anytime I teach with pen and ink, uh, just embracing mistakes and letting your mistakes guide you. So that's another way I tend to work. But just keep getting that question a lot about which pencil did you switch to? And um, I'm going to 
for my preference, and you're going to have your preference with the pencils that you use, but my preference is always gravitating more towards the B pencils um, when I'm initially working so that I can lay down dark values really quickly. And um, if I'm going to be working with pen and ink, I'll draw with the H pencils a lot so that I can erase my lines later. But when I'm drawing with graphite, just like tonight, I'm going to use the B pencils more than the H pencils because it's just what I, I tend to do because I can let up on my pressure to make them lighter. Okay, that's a lot of talking about my pencil choices, but that just keeps coming up. So I wanted to uh, talk about that for the people who keep coming back. Um, okay, so cylinders. Tree trunks are cylinders. That's the, the form that we're dealing with here, right? And we've talked a lot in these classes so far about contour lines when rendering uh, specific forms. So when we're rendering a cylinder, uh, maybe on a little bit of a curve, but the vertical lines are gonna be mostly straight. They're gonna follow whatever curve the uh, vertical sides of the tree trunk are following. And then the uh, tree trunk is rounded, right? Like a cylinder is rounded on the, the horizontal axis. So on the vertical axis, we're gonna have lines that uh, are mostly straight or maybe slightly curved with the, the direction that the, the tree trunk curves. And then on the horizontal axis, we're gonna have rounded lines that curve. If we were looking at the tree, like our eye level is right here, it may appear that the curve switches directions below our eye level and begins to curve at a downward angle. So it just depends on how, where we are the viewer as we're looking at the tree. Um, and if that is confusing, you can watch the, the class on intro to linear perspective that talks about um, how, uh, what happens to horizontal lines at the, the viewer's eye level, et cetera. Okay, um, and all of those classes are, are on YouTube or Jimena may have dropped the link in the chat already. Okay, so we maybe are gonna have a lot of cylinder shapes, but then there might also be a part of the tree where it you know, turns into another trunk, right? Another cylinder begins to grow off of the side of this cylinder. So you maybe, if there was a tree trunk that was cut off, you might have something that looks like that. Um, and so like my tree has a, a moment like that in the photograph and this isn't exactly like the photograph, but so you'll have whatever contours are happening there, but still a cylindrical shape, right? Okay, so I've got that sort of thing happening on my tree and then I've got the tree bark um, and then I've got some leaves, I've got vines. So as I'm looking at those, um, I'm looking for the shape that I'm seeing on that tree bark. So depending on how close to me or how far away the tree bark is, I maybe am seeing more detail or more value on certain parts of the bark as opposed to farther away. Uh, right here, I'm seeing a lot of detail on the bark so I can draw a more accurate representation of the shape that I'm seeing but that texture of the tree bark is going to follow the contours that I've laid out on my sketch. So it's going to curve with the tree. If there's a part of the tree that kind of dips and curves in, the bark is going to follow that as well. And then on parts of the bark that are farther away from me, I'm going to see those shapes a little smaller, less distinct. I'm going to see less detail and less value on those areas of bark. So I might just do a lot of repeated shapes for the bark there and not worry about putting as much detail on the ones that are farther away from me and appear smaller. When it comes to things like vines and leaves and really bark and, and every detailed thing that's happening, it's really easy to get overwhelmed with drawing a tree because there's so much repetition. There's so much of the same shapes like with the vines, there's so many vines here. And I could drive myself crazy and try to draw every vine or I can just focus on a few 
prominent vines that are really jumping out at me. And same thing with the bark, the ones that are closer to me, I'll put a lot of detail on those. The ones that are farther away, I can get away with just doing like a loose rendering of the impression of those vines or maybe just the shadow on the side of one of the vines. Same thing with the leaves. Some of the leaves are gonna be nice and big and detailed because they're really close to me. And then other leaves, so I'm gonna really try to match the shape that I'm seeing in those leaves. But then the leaves that are farther away, uh, I can maybe just do some little heart shapes to designate where those are gonna go later. Okay, and that's talking about the, the things that are sort of in the foreground and the middle ground. But when it comes to these leaves that are really far away in the distance here, you're not gonna put a heart shape or an oval shape or a teardrop shape or you know a leaf shape for those because we wanna draw things as we're seeing them. When we look at just the, the distant leaves in a photograph like this, what are we seeing in regards to the light? What sort of shapes are we seeing in regards to the light? I see a big why not, and I'll tell you why not. This is what get into the why not right now. <laughs> I just saw that pop up in the chat. Um, so I see silhouettes, triangles. And then I'll let you sift through the, I'm just seeing the ones that are like popping up on my screen, but do you want to tell me the answers we're seeing about what? Yes. Sort of so besides the ones that you've said already, we have trapezoid, um, blobs, polygons, um, geometric shapes, hexagon, splatters, dots. Okay, I love it. Splatters and dots. That's more what I'm looking for. Yeah, you're seeing, you're not seeing, you know, necessarily um, distinct shapes right there. You're seeing more of these like blobs or these specks or splatters. Yeah, you're seeing more, you're seeing pure value is what you're seeing. You're seeing a shift in light and dark, and you're seeing some abstracted shapes you're seeing a mass of leaves with little keyholes in between them and you know that those are leaves like if i were to you know block off everything else in this picture what what's telling you that those are leaves are the branches that they're attached to so you're reading those little blobs of light and dark as leaves um, but I guarantee you when you go to draw them, a lot of folks might still try to do this, try to force, you know, these oval shapes on those distant leaves. And you're not seeing them like that. You maybe you're seeing these leaves in the middle ground as little oval shapes, but those leaves are way too far away. Just because you know what shape they are doesn't mean you're going to draw them as that shape in your drawing because we want to draw things as we see them, not as we imagine them. And when we start to draw more from our imagination versus how we uh, we see them, that's when things get confusing to, to the viewer. So um, if I were to just sketch these little, you know, patchy splatters and points and, you know, these just abstracted lines like this I'm what I'm sketching is the overall mass of leaves that I'm seeing there and I guarantee you that is going to suggest to the viewer nobody's going to question what that blob is when it's attached to something that's so clearly a tree they're going to read it as um as leaves so we want to suggest to our viewer what they're looking at rather than you know, spell it out so clearly here. Um, I used an analogy in the last class, which I'll use again, even if you saw the last class, because I think it's worth repeating. And um, that is, you know, when you're watching television or a movie, if you're watching like say a, a movie of the week, there might be a character that um, is reoccurring or hasn't been back in a while. And since it's like, you know, more of a soap opera or movie of the week type thing, what they're going to do is they're going to 
give you a lot of information and like hold your hand as the viewer to tell you like what's up with this character what's their backstory and like you know repeat parts of their backstory so that you don't really have to think to be able to follow along with the show but when you watch like an art house film there maybe is none of that backstory about the character. There's little details that suggest something about that character. And from those details, you understand who that person is and you put together their backstory. And with a good work of art, I think it's the same way. Like your viewer is smarter than uh, people sometimes give them credit for. Like when we look at something that looks like this, we're, when it's next to something that looks like a tree, we're very likely to read that as a tree. We don't need to have our hands held to understand that we're looking at leaves here, right? So trust that the person looking at your drawing is smart enough to fill in the blanks and try just suggesting these things in subtle details and, and clever tricks rather than uh, trying to spell it out because, it, and also, that's not how you're seeing it with your eyes. So if you just draw things as you see them, you'll be better off. Um, another trick is to take this um, photograph and uh, invert it, invert the light. So you can do that on Photoshop or there's several apps. Um, I have an app on my phone called uh, Fonto that I like to use. It's P-H-O-N-T-O. Um, Fonto. There's so many apps that will do this, but this is the one that I like. Um, but it, it has a function where it will just invert the photo and all the light will be dark, all the dark will be light. And so if we do that, you'll see all of the white light in this photograph will be showing up as black and everything that is absolutely black in the photo will be showing up as white. So then it's really easy to see those shapes of dark and light, the shapes of the value, because that's um, how we see the world. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to where I left off in my drawing uh, the last time and keep working from here and I'll explain how I got here. So I was observing this photograph and following uh, the rules that I just laid out to you um, a moment ago in the preliminary sketch and right now it kind of feels like a jungle and jumble of lines but I've got a light sketch of my cylindrical shape of my tree trunk here, and then me, my two big tree trunks um, on this side, and then there's one that curves back this way. And the way that I helped myself to know which direction I'm gonna add the value on top of these tree trunks is I sketched in my contours, and I cannot uh, promote sketching in the contours like this enough. Um, if you don't do this when you're you're starting out drawing something in three dimensions, it it's just very helpful, especially if you do it on something like this tree, because we're gonna add so much value to this tree that it's gonna be easy to cover up those preliminary uh, contour lines. And it just helps so much to know as I'm starting to add my value which direction I need to be uh, curving as I'm adding the value. So I'm just gonna start adding some texture here to, to this, this tree trunk. And so I'm not gonna put a little squiggle line for every line of bark on the whole tree. I could definitely do that if I had the patience. And if I was gonna do that, I wouldn't wanna put the same pressure on every squiggle line that I put, I would want to make sure that the I'm using the appropriate pressure to the level of value that I'm seeing. So this is the advanced class. So I know I'm taking this long in the class to bring this up, but um, hopefully everyone in the class has an awareness of value shading techniques if they're uh, here in the advanced class. If not, you can check out all those links that we've put in the chat or find the other classes on YouTube. But um, so in tonal shading in this example, we've got our zero to 10 on the value scale, 10 being our solid black, zero being our absolute white blank paper. And that's going to be achieved through the pressure that we're putting on our pencil or the level of pencil that we're using. If you're using the same pencil throughout your drawing, you definitely need to uh, 
amend the amount of pressure that you're putting on the pencil throughout. So um, I'm just going to put an extra sheet of paper underneath me here because I'm realizing I'm smearing a lot of these lines being left handed here. So if that's happening to you, putting a spare piece of paper underneath can be really helpful. But I'm going to vary the amount of pressure that I'm putting as I'm seeing those darker values. If I put the same amount of pressure through the whole thing, then I'm confusing my viewer, right? I'm telling them that it gets really dark on every piece of bark on the whole tree trunk, and it doesn't. It gets very dark on the ones that are closer to me where I can really see a lot of shadows in between the bark there. And then maybe a few moments right here. But for the rest of this bark, I could kind of get away with just filling it in with some, some tonal shading. But as I do that, I'm going to follow the curved line of the contours that I laid out for myself there. So Adrian, we have a question from Carol. Um, would you recommend measuring the picture and then placing a, um, grid lines on your work? Yeah, that can be really helpful if you're struggling with the proportions in your drawing. Uh, using a grid can be um, extremely helpful to um, to find the, the proportions or where things start. Um, you can kind of create, a, you can even create like a bit of a connect the dots for yourself without gridding it. Um, many years ago, I worked for um, a lot of paint and sip companies. Um, and at all of those paint and sip uh, nights that I, I used to instruct at, um, we would do a thing where we would help people get started with, you know, if, if it was, you know, like a skyline or something, we would say, hold your fingers, like just start three fingers down, and then we're going to put the, you know, the first building here, and then hold your fingers, you know, this far down on the page, and et cetera. Like we would kind of map it out and create these connect the dot points. And I do that in my work all the time. I just kind of eyeball it and say like, all right, this tree trunk is about here in the photo and this branch is here and kind of map things out that way. Um, but yeah, putting a grid on it or measuring is, is a really helpful way to match your proportions. Um, okay, so the, the next thing I wanted to talk about was, so we're kind of drawing from the, what's the farthest back on the, any particular part of the, the tree and then working our way forward. So the bark is going to be underneath like the vine in my photograph or some of the leaves are going to be even on top of some of the vines. So I like to kind of jump around while I'm drawing a subject like a tree so that I don't get too stuck in one spot, um, but also so that I can account for the different layers of what's happening on the tree. So if I were to like really go to town drawing all of this bark right here, then I might get done and realize, oh, there's a vine that I wanted to put in there and the vine is, you know, over the bark and now I've already drawn the bark. So it's better to kind of designate the spot where that vine is going to go early on before you get too far and then uh, put it in sort of like that. Uh, that way you don't have to erase anything back out. Like I'm going to have to erase some of that value back out right there if I want to put this vine in. So, and it definitely just lost something there when I had to do that. So. But as I put it in, I want to make sure that I'm accounting for the little curve of the vine around the edge of the contours of the tree. So I just sort of looped it around the side there. Think about like how a ribbon uh, will undulate. And then I'm just kind of drawing the, the squiggle line of, of the vine. But that may feel a little pasted on right there until I connect it with the value. So I'm going to connect it with the value by adding a 
dark line to one side of it as I'm seeing it. And all of the little imperfections and character of every aspect of the tree that you're looking at are what's going to make it really come alive and feel like a tree. So really try to get in there and notice like the subtle variation in how a vine is curved, you know, try not to just make it look like a straight noodle coming across the, um, you know, you really want to get like a little, uh, a little detail going to it, like a little knob or a interesting bend, you know, whatever detail you're seeing in your vines. Um, okay, and then when it comes to things like these branches that are very dark and have a lot of value heavy, like the ones that are right here in my photograph, um, I'm going to fill those in with my, my darkest value, all those shapes that I'm seeing. But again, I want to follow the, the contours of the tree trunk as I do that. There was one tree branch right here, like just for example, if I were to take this, this tree branch and because it's that dark, if I were to just take my pencil and just fill it in solid like this, that's not going to be quite as convincing as if I do this, if I curve every application of that value curve it around the cylindrical shape. It just feels more rounded when I do that. Um, and if you have already added some dark value to your tree branch where it was really dark and you didn't do that, you can just go in and like add a little knob or something to the edge of it and really curve your lines around that so that it starts to feel more curved following the contours and adding value in the way that you're seeing them in your photograph is really what it is going to make the, the the tree come to life and feel like it has a weight and um, like it has a life to it and those little details and the character. So I'm going to speed it up a little bit here because I really want to get some detail going on one of these these bigger tree branches and it's really hard to follow my own advice as I'm trying to go quickly. But I'm going to stop and do what I just said, really curve my, even though it's solid dark, when I add that solid dark in a way that follows the contours, it's going to have a weight to it. So when it comes to things like trees, I always like to say it doesn't have to look like that tree, it just has to look like a tree. And I find myself saying that for a lot of organic things like clouds, trees, flowers, etc. Um, but if you really, you know, care about matching the accuracy in your photograph, then, you know, just take your time. Uh, but I think editing things out and making, you know, edits like that can be just a great way to keep your sanity when you're drawing. There are some subjects where matching accuracy, like with the drapery, if you watched uh, last week's class on uh, drawing drapery, I mentioned how I think it's important to maintain accuracy as you're mapping out the drapery, but that's only so that you don't get lost. And yes, you can get lost when drawing a tree if you don't map everything out exactly how you're seeing it, but you could also drive yourself crazy trying to match the accuracy of things like all of these branches that are happening. So you kind of just have to weigh the pros and cons of your sanity versus getting a little lost. And I think drapery is so obscure um, of a subject matter in our brains and trees are a little bit more familiar to us. So it's a little bit easier to not get lost drawing a tree. And that's why I think um, it's better to make edits as you go, because like these vines, for example, there are so many vines there and I could maybe just suggest a tangle of vines 
through a bunch of squiggly lines that don't necessarily accurately depict the exact vines that I'm looking at there, but it's close enough. So that's where I think it's okay to let go of accuracy. So Adrian, we do have a question here. Um, Linda would like to know if you have any tips to distinguish where two dark branches cross to keep on the foreground. Um, let me see if I have a moment like that in my photographs that I could reference. Also, if anybody wants to take a screenshot right now is the moment. Oh, okay. I could even turn it sideways so that you can see the whole thing. Okay, I think that's long enough. Yeah, um, it's good. <laughs> I like I didn't want to pull it away too quick. Um, okay, so like where a tree branch crosses over another branch, I've got a moment right here where this one sort of crosses over. So I guess you distinguish which one is going in front and then uh, note like what the, the light is doing in that moment. Like in mine, this one seems to be going in front. So I'm going to make sure that the value that I put on that one is blocking out the lines of the one underneath it and maybe blur the lines of the one behind it so that it feels more distant and this one feels a little more crisp and clear and that'll definitely give a sense that that branch is in front of the other branch. All right, so once you get to to a point in your drawing like this where you've mapped out everything you've accounted for the uh, the vines and the leaves that you're going to focus on the most and where you're going to put you know your details and character where you're going to focus your attention and you've mapped all of that out for yourself then it's really just a matter of filling in the value with the uh, the right filling in the value shapes with the right amount of value. So using the appropriate pressure on your pencil, but um, just filling in those areas. So this area of the drawing where I noticed things were getting an absolute 10 or solid black, I filled all that in pretty quickly, but I didn't fill in everything that I was seeing that, that got that dark. So let me, focus my attention there for a while. So underneath the, the shadows of a lot of these leaves, I'm just bouncing around and designating this large area of, of dark shadows that I'm seeing. And working like this can look a little messy at first. You really just have to trust yourself that things are going to come together if it feels sort of disjointed or like uh, not like anything yet, then just trust the process of building up value layers like this. I think designating where those shadows are going to go is a good placeholder for me when as I'm working, then I, I can kind of go back and add the details later and it's easier to find where I am on these individual leaves because I'm like, oh, right, here's the dark shadow underneath all of the leaves, even though I didn't draw the, the leaves just yet. Um, so that's working general to specific. That's a, a term that a lot of artists and art teachers use, meaning that you just lay down your, your general values and then uh, begin adding more specific lines and details later. And I think that's a great approach to drawing anything but specifically a tree because if you don't do it that way and you just start drawing the details first and then you realize that there's something like a branch that went in front um, or you know something like that that you want to add later it can be harder if you're already attached to a lot of details in your drawing. So I'm bouncing around a lot in my drawing and just giving everything 
a layer of value as I go, but I really need to get specific here at some point because I'm running out of time. All right, I'm going to just focus my attention where I kind of started focusing my attention, which was right right here on, on this tree trunk because I'm noticing we're running low on time. So Adrian, we have a question from Carol. Um, should we be concerned about mapping the light source at the beginning or do we add the white pencil at the end? How would you go about that? Um, yes, you want to account for where your your absolute whites are going to be. So like that's why I kind of designated where that vine was there so that I don't add any dark value on top of that vine. So anything that gets really light, you want to make sure you designate that early on so that you when you're adding value, you can make sure to add value all around that moment of a highlight. Um, yeah, you really want to plan ahead for where your your light is going to be. And with a graphite drawing, this doesn't happen so much, um, but with painting, um, you know, if you were going to add watercolor or something to this later, you would really want to plan for where uh, certain colors were going to go early on. Like, I don't know, when it comes to, I know this is a drawing class, but I would just throw this in there just because I've taught so many painting classes that have gone awry or not have gone awry, but where somebody's tree painting has gone awry because they got excited and started painting their leaves before painting their sky. So number one rule of tree painting, paint your sky first and then draw your trees. But when you're drawing a tree, um, if the sky is pretty light, you can just leave it, leave it blank and just do your leaves or your patchy areas where the leaves are going, you know, around the blank paper and just leave the paper blank where the sky is. Uh, for these large areas of tree, uh, or sorry, leaf masses up here where I kind of sketched them in as one big mass and just had my little scratchy line, uh, you can fill those in with like a diagonal line, uh, just layering a diagonal line that creates one value for that massive tree that can be really lovely. I'm going to uh, just kind of sample that on this. I did a printout of this isn't my my actual tree drawing here, but on the printout, if I were to just, you know, do a, a diagonal line to fill in this mass of leaves here that could easily be read as the mass of leaves. And then I'm not doing the, the tedious effort of, you know, going in and, and filling in the exact value that I'm seeing there. So I can just sort of fill it in all as one mass and then maybe go in and add some detailed moments or some darker lines in between, like where some of the leaves were a little darker than others, et cetera. So that's what I, I've started to do here is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, build in this, this entire mass of leaves with diagonal lines and then leaving it blank where the light is peeking through. And then I can kind of add a little bit of like a patchy dark moment here and there just for some variety in that value. And that is a much more convincing way to render leaves in the distance than forcing a bunch of oval shapes that are not visible. So a lot of people sent me gorgeous photographs last time um, I taught this class with their examples, which was so fun and I love to see those. And what I saw that was just warmed my heart out of all of those examples were people letting the, the tree, you know, just 
the drawing speak for itself and sort of disappear on the page. So I feel like that's a much more con you know, convincing or feels more familiar to me in what I see when I look at a tree because when I'm outdoors and I'm looking at a tree with my naked eye, not taking a photograph with it, um, I'm looking up at the tree, right? And the sun is in the sky. And so it's maybe giving like a bit of a glare to one side of the tree or a lot of the leaves. And there's definitely a sense of not being able to really focus my eyes on leaves that are far in the distance, right? That are really far overhead like this. So when you draw a tree like this, where you're just suggesting things that are really distant, I think it easily evokes an emotion to people who are looking at it because it feels more like it looks when we look at a tree with our eyes versus, you know, zooming in and, and taking a detailed photo in the, the perfect midday light where the light's not doing that to it, right? So. Uh, all of those examples that people sent me that were inspired by my example here and maybe not quote unquote finished, but um, you know, in like a mid stage like this where parts of it were really developed and other parts were very loose and sketchy. They were so lovely. There were so many gorgeous examples and thank you, you know, to everyone who shared those with me by either tagging me on social media or sending them directly to me. It was just really fun to see the drawings that came out of this class. And I could tell that people were really taking my suggestions to heart. So um, hopefully you're, you're doing the same with your examples now where you're, you know, following the contours of the curves of your, your tree branches or yeah, tree branches and your tree trunks you know, be really sketchy in your application of values that are in the, the middle ground or background far away from you, or, you know, just next to an area where you've put a lot of detail. Be like the art house film and just suggest a few details rather than telling us, you know, every every flashback moment of this character's life story of this tree's story, like we don't need to outline every piece of bark. For one, we can't necessarily see every detail on every piece of bark and our eyes will fill in the gap if you just sort of suggest a few pieces of bark like this and then let the rest of it be sketchy. But try to, if your tree is looking like very uniform and everything looks a little too perfect on the tree, really look for some distinguishing characteristic in the, the tree that you're you're referencing that you're drawing from and you know focus all your attention on that gnarly knob that's sticking out or that one vine um, that's wrapping around really give you know a lot of detail to those specific things and and just that one moment will you know bring that bring that tree drawing to life. Uh, so if you, one question. Um, um, Janet would like to know if um, there's a difference between drawing on an easel versus a flat surface. Is it more personal preference or is there actually a difference? And if so, which one would you recommend? Um, I really do prefer to draw on an incline. Um, I have a, a drafting table at home and I keep meaning to move it into my, my studio space here because I, I really do like the the incline just for my back because I'm, you know, sitting and drawing for long periods of time and uh, I just think it's easier on my posture. Um, but when it comes to an easel, um, I will put a drawing, sometimes I'll tape it to the wall or uh, on my easel when I'm just doing like the big preliminary sketching part. If I'm working on large paper, if I'm working on small paper, I'm not likely to put a small piece of paper on my easel, but um, the drafting table is definitely preferable just to have that incline. Uh, one thing you could get is here, I'll grab it. I've got one here in my studio, the artist's loft. Um, 
One of these things, the artist loft clipboard um, things, what's the official name for these? I'm so sorry, I'm like, should know. But just your, you know, your, your drawing clipped board. You can sit on the couch with one of these or um, put it on your lap and then you've basically got a portable um, drafting table and you can have that on an incline and that's much easier on your back. When I was in college, I did a, a lot of my art was done on my couch with one of those. So um, Artist Loft makes those. That's an Artist Loft, one of those and I, I recommend those for sure. Perfect. And I think that's it for questions. Okay. Um, well, I'd love to see some of y'all's examples um, before we we say goodbye. Sure. So spotlight it for people. Let me see. There's Shauna. Oh, there Shauna, go. that's gorgeous. Very and nice. We have Camilla. Oh, Camilla, you've joined us before and had lovely work. Look at that. Oh, I love how you're putting, you're doing those big patches of leaves with um, just some nice soft value. Camilla's one to watch. Look at this. Ooh, I love it. Yeah, those value shapes, how you're, you're blocking out your, your value shapes there and filling those in with the appropriate value that you're seeing. And then Barbara. Oh, I love the detail on that. Yes, the texture that you're getting and all of those details is so lovely. And then Michael. Very nice, Michael. Yeah, that's a great silhouette. I love how you're, you're really con you're really convincing me of all those leaves in the distance there. And then Ethel. Very nice. And Raymond. All right, Raymond. Yeah, take it slow. Don't rush putting those values in. I can really tell you, you've got a good uh, sketch going there with all the, the textures mapped out. We have John. Oh, very nice, John. I remember you had a drawing from the last class with that hand there, right? Nice. Yeah. We have Catherine. Oh, I love how you're mapping out those, those distant leaves. And Gail. Oh, look at the perspective on that. Yeah, and you're really convincing us of how we're looking up at that by all the detail on the, the bottom and the less detail as it goes up. Really nice. And Patty. Very cool. Love yeah. all the contour curves on there. These are so great, everyone. And yeah, if we didn't get a chance to spotlight you, then we'll just, uh, hopefully you can post on social media or share it with us later. Um, share it with me later, I mean, send email them to me. I love when people email me their drawings. It's really rewarding to, to see your work, so. Um, well, thank you everyone uh, for another great class and uh, I'll be back next Wednesday and you can sign up for the class uh, where you found this class on the, the Michaels website. Um, I see somebody asking for my email I can put it on the, the screen one more time. Um, it is just adrianhodge at gmail.com. I put it on my desk. I'm gonna... Sorry, one, one second. Sorry, I was trying to put it in the in the. I'll be right. There we go. <laughs> I'm putting it in the chat as well. Okay, cool. Thank you. That would have been good too. They Here both work. The more the better, I think. All right. Well, uh, thank you guys all again. I really enjoyed it, and uh, see you in the next class. Perfect. Thank you so much, Adrian. Thanks everyone for coming today. See you later. Great. Good night. Bye.